Hi, good morning, everybody. I'm sorry I can't be with you in person. It's because rather ironically for a day on health, I'm not feeling very well today. Um, so that it's a long COVID situation. So I'm hoping there'll be some stuff about that later. Anyway, today um, I'm going to talk to you from, from Brighton about an aspect of consciousness that I find incredibly interesting. And it's a, it's a project that I've been involved with for the last uh, two or three years called The Dream Machine. And I want to start with a quote and a very short video. So here's the quote. And the artist, Paul Gauguin. And now let me just show you a very short video about the project. Bringing together this incredible team of extraordinary minds, all coming from different backgrounds with different expertise, to co-build and design and develop this project has been amazing. One of the great joys of the Dream Machine project is that the scientific and the philosophical aspects have been built into the project from the very beginning. We're investigating a phenomenon that's still not widely understood, how flickering light generates this kaleidoscopic, vivid, immersive range of experiences for people. So we're really making something that is um, internal and quite transcendental and personal into a collective experience. Because of the nature of the experience, we're hoping that what will really happen is that it will engender conversation and so every stage of the dream machine has been designed in a way to really enable people to talk to each other. This particular project is unlike anything because your eyes are closed and your brain is creating the visual. It's the first time I've actually composed something specifically to be played in a 360 dimensional sound. So that's allowed me to do much more than I've ever done. There are more sounds in it than, than I would put in a stereo track. So it's a little bit like moving from black and white to colour. The technology had to hide itself away um, and simply become a way of communication. I, from my side, was very, yeah, hugely intrigued by the possibilities of the Dream Machine. I was deeply impressed by the scale and the scope and the remit. We love working in areas where no one's sort of trodden uh, before. For me, seeing the responses of participants when they come out the other side of the curtain and they've just had this experience and they look to each other or, or they look at us. It's just so rare and so magical um, that, that someone can have that surprise in their life and, and that you can share in that moment. Being inside this thing is kind of magic. It completely sort of envelops you it saw the entire universe go by behind my own closed eyes. I saw colours that I haven't seen for years. Vibrant, powerful, passionate colours. It was just absolutely, I found the whole experience absolutely fascinating. I'd recommend it to anyone, regardless of their age, because they could get the same feeling. So I was lucky enough to be the lead scientist on this incredible project called Dream Machine. But <clears throat> what is it? I, I'll tell you a little bit more about it, where it came from and where it's going and what it is. So the Dream Machine has its roots both in art and in science. This is the artist Brian Geisen, and he was a beat generation artist known for his cut up techniques, all these kinds of innovative forms of, of visual art, especially. And the scientist in question is William Gray Walter, one of the pioneering British neuroscientists of the 20th century, who, as well as being one of the people who really innovated um, how to measure electrical activity in the brain, he was also apparently a um, ex home trained explosive diffuser and a scuba diver and a wife swapper. So he's a very interesting character. Anyway, they both uh, had, had started to become fascinated by a simple effect, an effect that some of you might have experienced um, at one time or another uh, before. And this is the effect that flashing light at a particular frequency on your closed eyes can have. So the story goes from Brian Geisen's side that he was on a bus in the south of France um, 
and he was dozing off. So he was beginning to fall asleep. His eyes were closed and the sun was setting and it was shining through a stand of trees. So it gave rise to this kind of stroboscopic effect. And at the, at the, as the light flashed, he started to experience these explosions of color and shape and pattern in his mind. Experiences that stopped as soon as the, the sun left the trees. And Geisen was just intrigued by this and thought that he wanted to figure out how to make this experience more accessible on demand and make it available to everybody. In fact, he thought it might become more popular than the television. And William Gray Walter, he found William Gray Walter, who in his lab in Bristol had been looking at the effects of stroboscopic light on the brain. And, and I found this chapter in Gray Walter's 1953 original seminal book about neuroscience called The Living Brain called Revelation by Flickr, which is a wonderful title. And it's all about how the brain entrains itself to flashing light, but also how this gives rise to this, these really unexpected and powerful uh, perceptual effects, these conscious experiences that are you know, kind of unrelated to what's out there because it's just white light, yet people see colors and shapes and all sorts of things. So um, Walter, together with, with Geisen and, and uh, a mathematician, Ian Somerville, Geisen developed the first dream machine, which was charmingly lo-fi, in the late 1950s, it was basically just a, a bright light which was suspended above a rotating turntable upon which there was this rotating cardboard cylinder with slits cut in it that would give a stroboscopic effect. And if you sat in front of this the right distance with your eyes closed, you would have these kinds of experiences. Now for Geisen, this was a, this was a very counter-cultural thing to do because instead of being fed art and experience and culture you generated it yourself you are the artist what the dream machine incites you to see is yours now the original dream machine remained a bit of a, a fringe item it didn't become more popular than the television i think we agree but it remained out there and people like william burroughs uh, was a great supporter the rolling stones liked it apparently but it never became mainstream and i'd never heard of brian geisen until shortly before the pandemic started, I got a phone call from Jennifer Crook, the woman you saw at the beginning of the video. He had a vision to reinvent the dream machine for the 21st century and to rebuild it as a collective experience as well. And the reason I got involved was because in my uh, research group at the University of Sussex with my colleague David Schwartzman and others, we've been fascinated by this phenomenon for about 10 years already. Uh, and we were using strobe lights that we bought from Austria to try and understand the brain basis of visual consciousness, because again, your eyes are closed, yet you have visual experiences. So I became involved in this, um, this project, and uh, we've done a number of experiments using it over the years. This is just, for instance, one um, study that we did where we asked the kinds of things that people experienced in the stroboscopic situation. So we gave them a questionnaire of this kind of thing, they they plot their answers. And basically what you see is that um, experiences in this strobe light, they're very strange, they're very vivid, um, they are very emotional, and they, uh, in some senses, similar-ish to some kinds of psychedelic experiences, that they're actually, in their fine-grained nature, very different. But they're certainly different from just looking at a light. So we've been working on this um, scientifically for ages, and then this opportunity to build the new dream machine came about. And this is um, what we did. We got together with a team of artists and engineers and designers um, and musicians, there's John Hopkins there, to recreate a new kind of dream machine. And we did a lot of a prototyping, which was quite intense during um, uh, the pandemic when we could. So eventually build this. This is the dream machine that we came up with. So instead of one or two people just looking at a flashing light in front of them, 20 or 30 people at a time can go into this environment they relax, they're, they're looked after very well all the time. And the strobe lights are hidden in the in the ceiling uh, next to that sort of big Oculus thing. There are 84 speakers in this uh, dream machine and spatial sound composed in, in 32 channels. So the sound and music provides a guide, a structure for each visitor through their experience, which lasts for about half an hour. But the interesting thing here is people go through it both individually because their eyes are closed, but also collectively, they go through it as a group as well. Um, it's very comfortable. People, there, there are guardians there that, that sort of guide people through breathing exercises at the beginning and, um, and at the end. If I was there in person, by the way, I'd be asking for a show of hands who actually went to the, 
the Dream Machine in, in London or anywhere else, because I hope a few of you did get to see it. Uh, where's the clicker here? Apologies, it wasn't working for a second. Now it's working again. So we eventually deployed the, the Dream Machine in four cities across the UK last summer in a Woolwich Public Market, in a Temple of Peace in Cardiff, in a deconsecrated church in Belfast, and in Murrayfield Ice Rink in the summer, where they don't generally do ice skating. In each case, we reconverted the building um, in combination working with, oh man. Yeah, working with, um, sorry, this, this internet clicker was working all right now, but it's not now. Um, Damn it. This is the dream machine in in the church in, in Belfast. And in each environment, we reconverted what we were doing. But very annoyingly, I can't seem to move on. It's moving on kind of randomly. So this is going to become a little bit like keynote karaoke uh, for me, I'm afraid. Um, this is the... Uh, the dream machine in Edinburgh in the ice rink that we had. Let me try once again, see if I can get it to move on. Can anybody just advance the slides for me because this isn't working? Yeah, okay, great. Just, just basically keep, keep going and I'll keep up. Um, so in each of the dream machine environments, we included um, places where people could come out because quite a powerful experience for people. They could come out and talk about what they experienced. Next slide, please and in fact draw what they experienced and we found this to be a very powerful uh, means for people to report what was going on um next slide so keep going through these slides very quickly there's a whole bunch of pictures next slide next slide so these are the kinds of things that people uh, report uh, or they draw when they come out and i was amazed that people love to draw so let's keep going through these and then we'll come to yeah so as well as just having people draw the experience we had them do some more systematic collected some more systematic data we designed this uh, this tablet interface that people use. Next slide, please. And um, what you can see here is that, I mean, we had basically up 40,000 people go to the Dream Machine last year. This is a sample of about 8,000 of them. The overwhelming emotion was uh, peace and, and also awe. Now, keep on this slide for a second. So one of the things we really noticed, and here's where it gets to a bit of health-related stuff, is that this experience really made people feel different and in most cases a lot better there's something about experiencing the power of your own mind and brain to generate experience that is really transformational very different from just seeing assuming the world just pours itself into your mind through the transparent windows of your eyes this revelation is is, is really powerful if you think and so what we're doing going forward is is trying to understand what the real therapeutic benefits of this method might be in the long term it's not just flashing a light at you. I think it's the whole surrounding, the whole context makes a difference. But having said that, there's a long history of light-based treatment for things like depression and, and grief, whether it's treating seasonal affective disorder um, or other forms of depression. And also the dream machine has certain parallels to psychedelics that they bring about an unusual, unexpected, vivid perceptual experience um, in your brains. And there's been some enthusiasm, I think perhaps a little bit uh, boost, boosted, overly boosted enthusiasm for psychedelics lately. But you know, to the extent that they work, they likely work because they bring about different experiences and the dream machine can do this too. So this is a, a future direction um, that we are, we're currently very excited to, to be working in. So next slide, please. I'll give the last word just as another short movie from one part. Having the ability, like Dream Machine accessing that part in your brain, which is just like, this is what your subconscious is thinking about, like without you even knowing. It's just like, our brains are powerful. <laughs> they are very powerful things. I would, I would consider it a life-changing thing to go through, 100%. That was one of our, one of our 40,000 participants. Um, next slide, please. So, Finish just by returning to the fact that for everybody in the dream machine, they had a different experience, even though they were in the exact same environment. And of course, one of the lessons of this is that that is true, not only in the dream machine, but everywhere, all at once, all the time, we're all having a different experience, even in the same shared objective reality, because next slide, please. Um, you know, we, 
just as we all have different, we're all different on the outside, we're all different on the inside too. So as the novelist Anais Nin said, we do not see things as they are, we see them as we are. Next slide, please. Um, so yes, we're all different on the outside, we're all different on the inside. Next slide, please. Um, I think we'll skip the movie for, for, for time, so just go on to the next slide. We have this project, um, which is part of the Dream Machine, called the Perception Census. And this is something, it's a call to action as well from me to you too. This is a, a unique project to try to measure how different we all are on the inside rather than on the outside. Psychologists and neuroscientists have studied this a little bit, but usually with very just on, on single aspects of perception. With the perception census, the QR code, by the way, will help you get access to it, is a way of mapping out perceptual diversity on many different dimensions at once. Next slide, please. Um, we, instead of just asking about one form of perception, we're interested in how people vary in all sorts of ways, in sound and their ability to perceive sound and music, how we experience time, the role of expectations that our brain has that shape our experience, how we experience color. Is my red the same as your red? All these different things. And the idea here is to try to understand the latent space, the underlying organizational structure by which we all vary on the, on the inside, because it's so hard to see. It seems to us that we see the world as it is. And so it's very hard to realize that we see the world as we are and other people might see it differently. Next slide, please. Um, We've already had more than 20,000 people take part from 100 countries. So this is already one of the, the largest experiment of this kind that's ever been done. But we're continuing to collect data because we want to make this a landmark study to unveil this hidden landscape of perceptual diversity. Next slide, please, and I'm almost done. Um, so perceptual diversity is, is the core concept. Yeah, I've written about it a, a little bit. Uh, you can throw up all the bullet points, please. Just go through them. Um, so yeah, it, it applies to all of us. So you may have heard about the term neurodiversity, of course, which is a hugely important term, highlighting the different ways that people with conditions like autism and ADHD experience things. But yeah, ironically, that term can reinforce the notion that if you're not neurodivergent, you see things as they are in a sort of neurotypical way. But what, what this project is trying to get at is that we all experience the world differently. And realizing that is a chance to cultivate a bit of humility about our perceptual experiences, to realize that, that we can all see things differently. And perhaps we live in perceptual echo chambers just as much as we live in social media echo chambers. And the key to getting out of echo chambers is, of course, to realize that we live uh, within them. So I think there's a lot to be gained purely from the recognition that our conscious experience, our perceptual universe, is a construction that's as unique to each of us as our skin color, as our height, as our personality. Um, it's not disconnected from the world, of course, but we, there is an objective reality, but we experience it in our own unique way. So next slide, please. Um, just want to acknowledge a large team of people working on this. It's, these are very big projects. And next slide, please. And I finished just with a, uh, the book again. But again, sorry for the, the slight snafu with the slides. The QR code will help you get to the perception census. My colleagues, Erin and Carrie, are also at a stand uh, with more information about all of this. So please go and see them, visit them. Um, look out for more news about the Dream Machine. Get in touch if you're interested in, in that and take part in the perception census. Every person taking part really does make a difference. And thank you very much for your attention.